late last night, the SEC filed a new motion in the SEC versus Ripple case to seal some of the expert testimony, these Daubert motions we've been talking about of late. Now, one of the lawyers in the XRP community says that based on the low quality and late filing of this motion, he thinks the SEC is falling further and further behind. We'll take a look at that short document. And in D.C., the Treasury and Maxine Waters are making some crypto deals behind closed doors. We'll take a look at some of the negotiations that might be happening right now and what kind of backdoor deal could lead to increased regulation for the crypto marketplace. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. Let's take a quick look at the crypto market before we dive in. We're down about 4% on the 24 hour, down to 1.02 trillion with Bitcoin at 22.2, Ethereum just over 1500, XRP at 35 cents, Cardano at 48 cents, and on down the list, pretty much everything down in that roughly 3 to 5% range over the last 24 hours. Now let's look at what the SEC did yesterday. We had a lot to talk about, so we didn't get to this because it was filed so late in the evening. The SEC filed a motion to seal in connection to these motions to exclude expert testimony. So here's the document. We'll run through it here just uh, real quick. It's not long. It's only two pages. You can tell they were in a rush. The Ripple side with their motion to seal we looked at yesterday had five or six pages. But two pages here, Layden Stewart, who we usually see again on these documents, addressed to Judge Torres. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Pursuant to the court's July 12th order, the SEC respectfully submits this motion to seal certain portions of the party's July 12th filings in connection with their motions to exclude expert testimony, the Daubert motions. Appendix 1 to this motion is a chart outlining the SEC's proposed redactions. Each document referenced in Appendix 1 is attached as an exhibit to this motion, with the SEC's proposed redactions highlighted in yellow. The SEC has met and conferred with defendants and expects defendants to object to most of the SEC's proposed redactions. Well, as you would expect, right? Uh, the Ripple team is not going to want to uh, have the SEC redact really anything here, especially when it deals with their expert testimony. In the document yesterday, we saw that Ripple said that their individual should be able to be redacted, but the SEC should not because of the public nature and disclosure that the agency should be facing, which does make sense. And if you look here, here's the appendix, you can see everything uh, here is listed as information identifying SEC expert. That's all these things they're trying to redact. So they don't want anyone to be able to see who these people are that are testifying against Ripple and in some cases supposedly representing XRP investors by proxy with some of their opinions and the assessments that they're making regarding the digital asset XRP. Now coming back to their writing here, with a few exceptions noted below, the SEC's proposed redactions are intended to protect the identities of the SEC's expert witnesses. As the court is aware, one of the SEC's experts was subjected to extensive threats and harassment after that individual's name was publicly disclosed by counsel for Amikai. The court granted the SEC's application to redact the names of Expert 1 and Expert 5 from the SEC's prior filings, and you can see here, narrowly tailored redactions as quoted. In order to protect the identities of the SEC experts, the SEC proposes redacting the name of each expert, as well as identifying information including contact info, educational and employment history, which could be used to decipher the witness's identity through online search engines or social media platforms, publications including quoted portions of publications, which could be traced back to the SEC expert, and affiliations. In addition to the identities of each of the five SEC experts, the SEC has also proposed redactions to protect the identities of consulting expert firms that assisted the SEC experts as well as employees of those firms. These proposed redactions are narrowly tailored to serve the interests of witness safety and the SEC's application should therefore be granted. 
So what you've got here is the SEC wants the names hidden, where they work hidden, people that work at places where they may work hidden, and any affiliation with any other entity hidden. So there would be no way for us to know who these people are, uh, where they work, what their background is, if they're a reliable expert witness. None of that would be made available to the public. Let me know what you think about that in the comment below. Is that right? Is that the way that our government should operate when they hire experts and pay them hundreds of dollars per hour? And we looked at that. The average witness uh, pay was something around $700 an hour. Earlier this year, we pulled up the, the file and looked through that. So we're paying taxpayer money, hundreds of dollars per hour for these expert witnesses, yet we don't get to see who the SEC is spending that money to bring in and testify supposedly on our behalf. Is that right? Let me know. I'm curious to hear what you have to say. I've got my own thoughts, but I want to hear you sound off in the comments. Continuing here in the document, the SEC is also submitting proposed limited redactions to four documents in order to prevent disclosure of personal information, including financial information of SEC experts 1, 3, and 4, which they were asked about in their depositions. These proposed redactions are appropriate since the SEC's experts' personal and financial information implicates significant privacy interests and is not relevant to the adjudication of the Daubert motions, and then lots of case citations here for the rest of that. Indeed, defendants do not make any arguments or even cite to the personal information that the SEC seeks to redact in any of the papers in support of their Daubert motions. The SEC understands that defendants are moving for leave to redact the names of third parties from their papers in support of the Daubert motions and have included proposed redactions of third party names in their motion to seal filed today. That's the one we looked at yesterday uh, before the SEC got theirs out. The SEC does not object to defendants' application, which is really interesting. Usually they do, but in this case, they're not going to object to Ripple's uh, proposals there, which makes sense. We looked at all the ones they had in detail, and they were very narrowly tailored and really did make sense, and they had pretty good backing for that. The SEC would be kind of fighting an uphill battle there trying to go against those. Continuing, if the court orders that the names of third parties be sealed, the SEC will redact all such names in accordance with the redactions proposed by defendants. Finally, the SEC notes that certain third parties whose documents or information are quoted or described in the party's papers in support of the Daubert motions may move to seal certain information they believe to be sensitive or proprietary. Those are the ones uh, that are associated with that deadline Judge Torres ruled on yesterday for next week. These are those non-parties that now have to move to seal if they want that information to be uh, sealed in these documents. So they have about a week left to propose those themselves, the non-parties, the witnesses themselves. The SEC will take a position on any such motions at the appropriate time, uh, she says here, respectfully submit, submitted Layden Stewart. And then again, back here to the appendix with all of these. Lots of redactions, over 50 here. So, uh, what can we glean from this? The SEC is, of course, trying to keep their experts out of our eyes here so that we aren't able to see who they are or what their background is. Um, it, it seems like the SEC preaches uh, being open and protecting investors, having disclosures, yet somehow that exempts them. So not what you really want to see, but it's the situation we find ourselves in. It seems up to this point, the court's been pretty lenient when it comes to granting these motions to seal. So we'll see. Judge Torres did rule on two items in fairly short order this past week. So expect to see um, some pretty quick action. I think she'll probably rule on these pretty quickly. With the other deadlines coming up next week, it would make sense to have everything organized and put in place here as we move towards those deadlines. Now, moving back here into the news, we have Treasury and Maxine Waters on crypto bill negotiations. So the question is, is it abandoned on the operating table or is it discreetly locked in? This is an interesting piece that just was in Forbes uh, earlier today. You can see July the uh, 23rd, which is, of course, today, published early, early in the morning. So we'll take a dive into this. It's a short one, but worth thinking about because 
we had a lot of hot and heavy talk about crypto bills and the no action. So now the question is, are there negotiations happening that we just aren't privy to? So diving in, following the $60 billion collapse of the Terra stablecoin that led to a $2 trillion downsizing of the crypto marketplace just a few months, the crypto industry that appears unable to self-regulate could be victim to fast-moving legislation negotiated behind closed doors by top-ranked elected members of Congress and Treasury officials. The author here confirmed with a person familiar with the negotiations who had seen various or variations of the language in the bill confirmed they were close to final but still requires buy-in from the Treasury and also the White House for the deal to be considered final. According to the source, participating in the negotiations were Financial Services Committee Chair Maxine Waters, Ranking Member Patrick McHenry, and a high-ranking Treasury official who reports directly to Secretary Yellen. You would think that that might be uh, someone that we've seen testify multiple times, Nellie Liang. She's been before the House and the Senate of late, and it would make sense that since she reports directly to Yellen and has been in these conversations for it to be her, although not named specifically. But they are looking to seal a deal for a bipartisan bill focused on stablecoin regulations that could pass Congress and get to Biden's desk to become law. This means that there could be a bill as early as next week that is essentially coming from the president's desk if the White House buys into the compromise, making this legislation vastly different than other bills the crypto industry has seen before. So what does this all mean? It means that crypto lobbyists could be sticking it out in D.C. over the weekend while their colleagues head to the beach, because there may be an extremely short window of time where any meaningful changes can be worked on by members of the Financial Services Committee leading to up to a mark appearing as soon as this coming Wednesday. So we're going to keep our eyes peeled for anything about this over the coming week. For readers that are not familiar with the idea of a markup, he says, it is typically the very last phase of how a bill makes it through a committee before the legislation is sent to the House floor for a vote to try to pass the legislation. While many in the crypto industry have used have been used to lots of hearings in Congress and discussions on the possibilities of different kinds of legislation, the vast majority of bills do not make it into law. For a bill that not many have seen yet, a few days is not a long time on Capitol Hill for stakeholders to provide suggested amendments or feedback before the markup. The real question is why would the Treasury be so focused now on seeing a major bill regulating stablecoins becoming law, particularly one that seems to diverge from their recommendations in the President's Working Group Report and Recommendations on Stablecoins. So here we go. Under Secretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance, Nelly Liang stated this past Monday in a speech that there could be flexibility in one of her original suggestions in the report that only banks issue stablecoins. That is very interesting. The question as to why this is all happening now could be either a genuine interest for lawmakers to tame the Wild West of crypto because the industry could not do it for themselves. Alternatively, though, there is perhaps a new concern from U.S. government officials that the crypto industry may disappear after the $60 billion stablecoin collapse resulted in a 66% shrinking of the total market cap for crypto overall. However, as Friday nights passed and no reports on the final results of negotiations have been reported on, the public may have to wait possibly until Wednesday when the bill enters markup to learn of the final language and proposed major policy uh, or policy of major stablecoin regulation that has far and wide reaching implications for the crypto industry. So this is really interesting. We hadn't really heard of anything happening of late on a stablecoin bill and the fact that there's negotiations going on behind the scene with the possibility of us seeing some kind of markup proposal maybe a vote even before the end of the summer and before the election that's kind of crazy so this uh, is something that hadn't been on my radar and so seeing that come out in Forbes of all places really piqued my interest at least. So we will follow up on this next week to see if this does get to the point where it's marked up and where it makes its way to a vote. This would have a significant impact if they did have language in there making it so that only banks could issue stable coins. That 
it would be really interesting to see. And then how does that impact someone like Circle? Are they going to become a bank and be granted a charter? How does this all play out? Has there already been a stable coin in the minds of uh, legislators? In regulators, it's going to be the winner in the space, at least here in the U.S. Does this pave the way for a U.S. CBDC or digital dollar? There's a lot of open questions. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm curious what your take is on stable coins and how the U.S. government is going to handle regulating them. And if they want to circumvent any of that and get something of their own out in a more rapid fashion, let me know in the comments. I hope you found this information to be helpful. If you did, drop a like on your way out. It helps the channel a ton. And make sure you get the information most important to you. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so I can keep you up to date on all the latest news. And don't forget, free shipping on everything in the merch store through tomorrow, which is Sunday. So free shipping through Sunday. Thank you so much for spending some time here with me. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.